Jehovah's Witnesses held their annual convention again this year. To their credit, they held it through Zoom for everybody's safety, and they've been encouraging people to get vaccinated, so that's a plus. But the videos they release at these conventions are historically bizarre. In past years, we got hits like, they're coming for us, let's hide in the basement. What is going on out there? They're just north of town, searching every house. Every house? Yeah, the neighborhood's in a panic. Let's stay calm and lean on Jehovah. At some point, we can expect the final attack on God's people. But Jehovah's gonna give us the courage we need. And this one, blame the victim for having a boyfriend. Later, my father explained to me that I couldn't remain in the home because I refused to change my lifestyle. Or this one, love your neighbor as yourself, except for those people. Carrie drew two mommies. She told me they're married to each other. My teacher says that all that matters is that people love each other and that they're happy. Hmm. Well, people have their own ideas about what is right and wrong. But what matters is how Jehovah feels. I could sit here all day listing Jehovah's Witnesses' greatest hits, but why don't we get into their latest convention videos and see what they had to say. Let's get into it. Honestly, what I already showed wasn't even the worst of it. There are some real doozies out there. A member of the governing body, Tony Morris, actually expressed excitement at the idea of people's deaths. And frankly, for friends of Jehovah God, how reassuring that they're finally gonna be gone. All these despicable enemies that have just reproached Jehovah's name, destroyed, never ever to live again. Now, it's not that we rejoice in someone's death, but when it comes to God's enemies, finally. Doesn't get much more depraved than that. Not all of these came out during conventions, but that's where they release most of their new material. So I was expecting this one to be interesting. Let me explain how it works. When I was in it, which was about 15 years ago, they'd have three conventions per year. A one-day convention, which they called the Special Assembly, a two-day convention called the Circuit Assembly, and finally, the three-day convention they called the District Convention. They usually rent out a big venue like a stadium or an arena, and they'll get all the Jehovah's Witnesses from the area to come and sit through eight hours of talks per day. It's a pretty boring event usually, but you're expected to be there, no matter what. Sometimes you have to travel out of state to make it. And every time they hold a convention, it has a theme. The first few clips I played were from a convention called Remain Loyal to Jehovah. The theme was that Armageddon would be here any five minutes now, something they've been saying since their inception in the late 1800s. Another one they held recently was called Love Never Fails, and it was all about how we should love our friends and family by shunning them if they don't do the right thing, in Jehovah's Witnesses' eyes, of course. Kind of an ass-backwards perspective on things, if you ask me. This year's convention was called... Welcome to this 2021 Powerful by Faith Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses. Powerful by Faith. So what's the idea behind it? They want to prove that God is real. I guess they're going back to basics. Mainline Christianity has been fighting this battle for decades, particularly young earth creationists. Jehovah's Witnesses consider themselves old earth creationists. So they believe the earth is about 4.5 billion years old, as the rest of the world does, but they believe that Adam and Eve were literally created by God and literally existed as real people in the Garden of Eden. So they believe in the creation myths and they reject evolution, but they believe the dinosaurs were real and really did walk the earth millions of years ago. For the most part, they deviate from traditional young earth creationist viewpoints in a lot of ways, so I thought it'd be interesting to see the narrative they try to spin up. Let's check out the first clip. Does something exist because you believe it does? Does something not exist simply because you don't believe in it? No. Truth is based on evidence. But what kind of evidence convinces you that something exists? We believe in many things we can't see. Air, wind, atoms, electricity, gravity, time. And we believe in things we can't hear. Galaxies, dog whistles, microorganisms. What convinces you? The effects. Effects that you can see, hear, feel. And the testimony from those who know the facts. Evidence. Evidence is the basis for faith. I find it fascinating that they're claiming that evidence is the basis of faith. It's actually the exact opposite. What is faith? The Bible says, quote, 
Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. To me, that means faith is belief without evidence. If we had evidence, we wouldn't need faith, because we know for a fact it's true. I don't have faith that gravity is real. I can examine the hard evidence. When I use deprogramming techniques on people, my ultimate goal is to pick apart every claim they make. Somebody says they believe God's name is Jehovah. I ask them why. They say, because they saw it on Jehovah's Witnesses' website once. I say, I'm not saying I can, but what if I could prove that it wasn't actually Jehovah. Ultimately, when they're backed into corners and they have no more quote-unquote evidence to lean on, all they have to say is, it's all about faith. It always boils down to faith. I just believe it. Faith is what you have when you don't have a good reason to believe something, but you believe it anyway. When people are faced with their delusion, Trump doesn't retake office in the middle of a presidential term, they find out there are millions of people suffering and dying around the world and God isn't doing a damn thing about it, they lose all their money in a scam, they call it a test of faith. Why would God do all these things? Because in these types of situations, seeing the destruction or believing that something was foretold or promised by God and it doesn't come true, it makes you doubt that God was real in the first place. It puts your faith to the test. If there was actual evidence, that God was real in the first place, and that he is, as described, truly benevolent and all-powerful, the world would be a different place than it is. I'm kind of dumbfounded by the fact that this guy is telling us that faith is evidence-based. What use is it, then, if we have evidence? Before we continue, I want to mention something. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, there's Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring, or you can check out my Etsy shop. I sell all kinds of cool stuff on there, including game and controller stands for every system from the Nintendo to the PlayStation 4, so give it a look. You might find something you like. Anyways, let's continue. Faith in the existence of the Creator has given our lives meaning and purpose. It has unlocked the answers to such questions as, why does the universe exist and what does the future hold? True, there are people who shy away from such questions, thinking that the answers are just beyond us. Some even teach that there is no purpose, no ultimate meaning in life. But where does that leave them? Without reliable guidance. I don't shy away from those questions. I recognize that we don't have an answer right now. You can claim to have the answer and bring up this big idea that explains everything in the world, and that's comforting at its face, but ultimately, you don't know the answer any more than I do. I'm just not afraid of saying the words I don't know. That's the fundamental difference. I understand that believing in God is a comfort to a lot of people, and that's fine, but the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses comes with a give and take. They give you something you don't even need them for, a belief in God, which can provide provide comfort to some people, even if it's misguided comfort. But Jehovah's Witnesses aren't just giving this away. You have to be part of the belief system. You have to be an active, baptized member. Otherwise, they say you won't make it through Armageddon. And you know what you have to do to get baptized? Knock on doors. You have to be their door-to-door -door salesman. And you don't just have to take part in it. You have to enjoy it. If you don't, then there's something wrong with you and they won't let you get baptized. Jehovah has not blessed you with his Holy Spirit. And aside from all of that, at the very end, he says, where does does that leave them without reliable guidance? I don't want anything to do with the disgusting fucked up guidance this group has to offer. We watched a bunch of clips at the beginning that shows us exactly where being a Jehovah's Witness leads people. I don't want to hate anybody for any intrinsic quality like being gay. I don't want to shun friends and family members because they break some stupid arbitrary rule like having a boyfriend. I don't want to have anything to do with a group that wishes death upon anybody of any kind, especially if those people are opponents of that group. Let's continue. Psalm 111, verse 10, says, The fear of Jehovah is the beginning of wisdom. All those observing his orders show good insight. His praise endures forever. Yes, clear thinking and practical application of knowledge begin with regarding the Creator with awe and profound respect. And, as indicated in the very next verse, this makes us happier people. Ah, there you go. So Jehovah's Witnesses are effectively what we call pre-suffers in the debate community. They can't win logically, so they back it up and claim God created the laws of logic. And you have to presuppose that to even have a debate, which means God exists. Checkmate, atheists. It's a sleazy way to win an argument, and ultimately, the same logic could be applied to anything. Aliens came in and created the universe and the laws of logic, so believing in aliens only makes sense. It just brings us right back to square one. The next section is basically a fine-tuning argument. 
argument. Let's keep listening. Think about the Earth's amazing cycles. Imagine what would happen if a city's water supply, its fresh air, its water, uh, were, were disrupted and the sewers were blocked. Uh, what would be the quality of life in that city? And yet, our planet is a closed system. Clean air and water are not shipped in from outer space. Waste matter is not rocketed out. So how does the Earth remain healthy and habitable? The water cycle, the carbon and oxygen cycles, and the nitrogen cycle, all tuned precisely to sustain life. Interesting choice of words in all this. First, let me address the fine-tuning argument. Everything is perfectly regulated to sustain us, right? I like this quote from Douglas Adams, writer of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Quote, if you imagine a puddle waking up one morning and thinking, this is an interesting world I find myself in, an interesting hole I find myself in, fits me rather neatly, doesn't it? In fact, it fits me staggeringly well. Must have been made to have me in it. Did he ever consider the possibility that life exists here because it was conducive to its existence, rather than the idea that the place was created to adapt to our existence. We have hard evidence that Earth wasn't always a hospitable place for humans. It used to be way too hot, and after that, it had way too little oxygen. It took billions of years to get where it is now. Now, before we continue, I want to address that one bit he said a second ago about it being a closed system. Our planet is a closed system. No, it's not. This is a common argument from people who argue that there must be a god because the second law of thermodynamics says that a closed system will eventually give way to entropy. It'll wind down and lose complexity and eventually turn into a mess. Without gasoline, a car engine will run down, stop, and decay. They'll argue that the fact that humans exist at all, and that we aren't winding down and decaying, defies the second law of thermodynamics. What they're ignoring is the fact that it only applies to closed system, which the Earth is not, i.e. the Earth has a fuel source, just like an engine does. The sun. The sun feeds energy into the system, which creates complexity and organization. When the sun burns out in a few billion years and we've moved on to another planet, the Earth will decay like any other closed system. Let's continue with the video. Of course, this doesn't mean that we can be careless stewards of our planet, but what remarkable systems! And much more could be said about the Earth's perfect location in our solar system, or about the planet's perfect orbit, tilt, rotational speed, and unusual moon, or about our solar system's perfect position in the Milky Way. Are all of these precise locations and elegant measurements the result of blind chance or of purposeful design? Anytime I hear this from somebody, I realize how little they know about how small we really are and how much stuff there is out there. The universe is so fucking big that it's incomprehensible to us. Let's keep watching. When we consider examples like these of God's power and wisdom, doesn't it make us wonder, how could anyone deny the evidence of an intelligent and loving designer? Romans 1.18 indicates that such denial requires suppressing the truth. Why? Well, notice what it says at Romans 1.19. Because what may be known about God is clearly evident among them, for God made it clear to them. Verse 20 says, For his invisible qualities are clearly seen from the world's creation onward, because they are perceived by the things made, even his eternal power and godship, so that they, namely those who suppress the truth, are inexcusable. I find it interesting that disbelief was even addressed in the Bible, because basically everybody believed it a couple thousand years ago when that was written. People had no other explanation for how things came to be. But now we understand how evolution works. We understand how the Big Bang happened, and both of those scientific explanations are heavily supported by facts and evidence. There is no doubt about it anymore. What we don't have is evidence that God did it. You can believe in God, and that's perfectly fine with me, but you have to understand and accept that you your belief is based solely on faith, 
not evidence. I'm not denying that there is a God. Maybe there is. But I'm certainly not accepting Jehovah's Witnesses' interpretation of God. Or their claim that they're God's mouthpiece on Earth. And all the crazy shit that stems from that. You can believe in God and simultaneously not accept that there's some prophet on Earth that you have to go through to get information from it. I'm honestly kind of confused about why they decided to go down this rabbit hole with their people in this conversation. Why even bother? Their main problems aren't people leaving the religion because they don't believe in God anymore. The biggest problem is people leaving over governing body members' disgusting behavior, lying under oath during the Australian Royal Commission, for example, or hating people over some intrinsic quality about them, like being gay, or wishing people were dead. Now, it's not that we rejoice in someone's death, but when it comes to God's enemies, finally. Why bother with this subject at all? Seems like they're preaching to the choir. But whatever, I guess I shouldn't be surprised when they ignore the elephant in the room. Anyways, that's all I've got for you. Thanks for watching, guys.